Last week we talked about how Mormons typically relate to non-Mormons, and I suggested that we take a look at Jesus and think about how Jesus might relate to Latter-day Saints. Now, the Bible never tells us exactly how Jesus would relate to Mormons because there weren't any Mormons back then, but it gives us a hint, a clue, uh, so that we can follow his example in how Jesus related to the Samaritans. And so I want to start with the assumption that Mormons are really, in many ways, a lot like Samaritans. You see, Jesus was Jewish, but Samaritans were members of a rival faith. And there was a long history of antagonism between the Samaritans and the Jews. The Samaritans had their own rival priesthood. They had their own rival temple. They had their own version of the scriptures. The Samaritans thought, thought that they were the right ones and the Jews were wrong and vice versa. And so when you look at the parallels, you can see that perhaps Mormons are to Christians in much the same relation that Samaritans were to Jews back in Jesus' day. So we're going to take a look at how Jesus interacted with Samaritans to help inform how we might interact with Latter-day Saints in our lives. We're going to look mainly at the, the encounter of Jesus with one Samaritan woman in John chapter 4. She's called the woman at the well. But first I want to stop and take a quick look at another encounter that Jesus had with Samaria in Luke chapter 9 where we learn that Jesus would rebuke anti-Mormonism. Jesus sent messengers ahead to a Samaritan village to prepare for his arrival. But the people of the village did not welcome Jesus because he was on his way to Jerusalem. When James and John saw this, they said to Jesus, Lord, should we call down fire from heaven and burn them up? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. So Jesus' followers were frustrated with the response they got from the Samaritan village, and so they wanted to lash out and go on the attack. And you know, a lot of Christians feel that way about Mormons here living in Utah. We want to lash out. We get frustrated at Mormon culture and about being a minority and, and the challenges of that, so we want to attack. But here we see that Jesus would rebuke that kind of attitude. Now, the next thing we see now moving to chapter 4, John chapter 4, is we see that Jesus would build bridges. Take a look at verse 6. Jesus, tired from the long walk, sat wearily beside the well about noontime. Soon a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Please give me a drink. The woman was surprised, for Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritans. She said to Jesus, you're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. Why are you asking me for a drink? So here we see Jesus building bridges to this Samaritan woman. And what we learn is four things. Number one, as we build bridges, just one person, one conversation at a time. Just stopping to engage a person and have a conversation with that person builds a bridge. And secondly, we build bridges by being willing to take risks and to cross cultural barriers. And so, you know, it pointed out in the passage that Jews just did not talk to, to Samaritans. They would consider themselves to be defiled by that encounter. Jesus risked that ceremonial defilement. He risked going against the norms. He risked going across a barrier to bridge to another culture. And third of all, we see that uh, we build bridges by being authentic. Jesus was just honest about his own personal needs. He said, look, I'm thirsty. Can you help me? And then fourth, we build bridges by going to the places where people are at, by going to the wells of life. A well was the center of the city. It's where people came and hang out. And Jesus would go to where people lived and where they hung out. He wouldn't stay isolated. So Jesus built bridges. And the next thing we see, if Jesus were to relate to Mormons, is we see that he would bring good news, not bad. Take a look at verse 10. Jesus replied, If you only knew the gift God has for you and who you are speaking to, you would ask me and I would give you living water. You see, Jesus' message was positive. It was a message of hope and good news and grace. It was a, a beautiful, appealing offer of good news. And then the next thing that we see in this passage that Jesus would do is that he would identify the real issues. Verse 19, Sir, the woman said, You must be a prophet. So tell me, why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship, while we Samaritans claim it is here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worshipped? Jesus replied, You Samaritans know very little about the one you worship, while we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. For God is spirit. So those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. 
Now what's going on here is that the woman was asking the wrong questions, but Jesus redirected her to the right questions. And in particular, he focused on two things. Number one, what is the way to find salvation? And number two, who is God? And those are actually the same questions, the same issues that divide Mormonism from traditional Christianity in the most significant ways. Where do you find salvation and who is God? And so those are the things that we're going to want to talk about with Latter-day Saints. Jesus was wise enough to identify the real issues. But then the next thing that we see in John chapter 4 is that Jesus would make himself known. Look at verse 25. The woman said, I know the Messiah is coming, the one who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. When we're interacting with Latter-day Saints, it's not just enough to have the right issues or the right answers to the right issues. We want to point people to the person of Jesus Christ himself and point them to a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so hopefully you can see here in John chapter 4, a glimpse of how Jesus might interact or how he might respond to Mormons. Now, there's one more part of the passage that is encouraging to me, and I want you to see this because I want you to know that there is a harvest here in Utah. Verse 31 says, The disciples were urging Jesus, Rabbi, eat something. But Jesus replied, I have a kind of food you know nothing about. My nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. You know the saying, Four months between planting and harvest. But I say, wake up and look around. The fields are already ripe for harvest. So Jesus might say to us, hey, wake up and look around. There's a harvest. God's at work in Utah like he never has been before. There's a greater harvest and more harvest potential than there ever has been since Mormons first came to Utah in 1847. And there's a lot of factors behind this, but Latter-day Saints are more open to spiritual conversations than they ever have been. And so, in light of that, and in fact, in light of everything we've seen in this whole series, let's finish with a couple of practical things, just some uh, reminders and some pointers, first of all, on how to thrive in Utah. Four things. Number one is... Stay connected with other believers. Get connected in your church, get involved. And the best thing is become part of a small group. And in a small group setting, you'll grow in your faith, but you'll also have people around you who've been living in Utah for a while. They can help you uh, learn the ropes. Uh, and then uh, number two is be friendly. Be gracious toward your neighbors. Be hospitable. You know, be patient with those relationships. And especially, don't be suspicious or insular yourself, or that'll come right back at you from them. And then the third tip about how to thrive is don't get all obsessed about Mormonism. Beyond knowing the basic facts and truths about Mormonism, what's really important is that you study your own faith. You become really well versed in what you believe and why you believe it. That'll really help you uh, to thrive here in Utah. Now, let me also conclude the series with a few practical tips about how not to just thrive yourself, but how to actually make an impact in Utah. And number one is to embrace the fact that you're a missionary. If you belong to Jesus Christ, then he sent you into the world. And that's true whether you live in Indianapolis or Los Angeles or whether you live in Utah. Whether you're here or somewhere else, you're a missionary. You might as well embrace that fact and, and step into Jesus' purpose for your life. That's the first thing if you want to have an impact. Then the second thing, a practical thing is just care about people in practical ways. Find ways to serve and help other people where they feel a need for your help. Helping your neighbor with a yard project or moving or watching their kids or whatever it might be. Just show compassion and help people in practical ways. Then uh, number three is don't talk so much about what you're against but about whom you're for. You know, if you start talking against Mormonism, they'll be offended. They'll withdraw and stop listening. So you need to talk about who you're for. You're for Jesus. You have this beautiful message of good news uh, about him. And then the fourth point is related to that. Don't argue and be contentious. Because Mormons believe that the spirit of contention, they say, is from the devil. If you start to become contentious, then they'll write you off. And then number five, I encourage you to invite. 
invite people into your life, and then as you begin to connect with them, invite them to church. In our church, we're going to be clear about the issues. We're going to tell the truth, but it's going to be in a sensitive way that's not going to offend someone so they'll never come back again. So we're going to create a safe place for someone on a spiritual journey to keep coming back until they understand the good news of, uh, of God's grace through Jesus Christ. Because God is at work in Utah, and we're part of that.